Hello, I'm Sami Ariane. I'm the founder of the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology and the FemPeak platform with the mission of raising women's socioeconomic status. Our guest on today's podcast is a very unique lady who also happened to be at a very unique time and place in the history of artificial intelligence. Pamela McCordock is the author of books about the history and philosophy of artificial intelligence, the future of engineering, and the role of women in technology. Having just entered the ninth decade of her life, Pamela continues to rock, and her understanding of technology puts some of us millennials to shame. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Pamela McCordock. We have a saying in Persian, the pottery maker often eats from broken pottery. <laughs> <laughs> That's like me. Uh, yes. the, the cobbler's children always need new shoes. Oh, really? That's that's interesting. Yes, that's uh, a really nice place to start. Thinking about how we use language, and you know how across cultures, yeah, you know, we all have similar kind of things that we experience, and you know, and, and different cultures have different ways of expressing the same thing. And then um, when you look at artificial intelligence how it's going to bring all of that together. It's going to be fascinating. Fascinating and very, very difficult. And that's a mm -hmm. huge uh, leap to take. Absolutely. So let's go back to the beginning of uh, your story. For our audience here who may not uh, be familiar or maybe they have heard your name, but they're not fully familiar with the magnitude of the importance of your work, the fact that you were there at the beginning of, you know, the journey of artificial intelligence, like when it was just starting out. Sometimes people compare artificial intelligence to electricity. I think it's so much bigger, so much bigger, because, because we haven't yet even seen the, the beginning of it. I was a garden variety English major at the University of California at Berkeley. And I was working my way through college as a typist, and it was a typewriter in those days. And two young assistant professors came to me, and one of them said, we know you're graduating in January. Would you like to work on our book in the meanwhile? And without even hesitating, I said, oh, yes. And uh, what's it about? <laughs> and they said, it's about artificial intelligence. And I said, oh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is 1960, the fall of 1960. And I'd seen the phrase because I'd been typing these course outlines and exams and whatnot, but I had no idea really what it was. And so one of them said to me, well, this is computers doing things that if humans did them, we'd say, ah, that's intelligent behavior. And you know, I've never heard a better definition of it since. So I went to work on the book on that uh, semester and summer I was off. And then I went away, um, said goodbye to the book. It was the first book of readings. Uh, they were trying to collect all the articles in AI for students. And I went away and did other things, but I was always very, very interested in what was going on. And I'd call Ed, who was Ed Feigenbaum, who was my my mentor and <laughs> employer at that point, so and say, what's new? What are you doing? And he'd always have something interesting for me to say. I published a couple of novels, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to write a novel about these interesting people in artificial intelligence. And then I thought, no, why, do I, why write a novel? Why not write a history? Just go around with my microphone, interview them, my tape recorder, uh, instant book, ha, ha, ha. It wasn't instant. It was really hard. I had to ask all kinds of questions I didn't know how to ask, but these people were infinitely, infinitely patient with me. And part of it was that nobody had asked them these things before. It was a, a fringe science. Nobody took it seriously. So I thought, okay. And that's how the book called Machines Who Think was published. I had a horrible time getting it published. I mean, I had, I still have letters from publishers who say, Oh, we've already published a book about computers. <laughs> this, this is how ignorant people were. Anyway, the book came out. Uh, it did okay. Uh, but what I didn't realize is that a bunch of students all over the world were reading this book and thinking, I want to be in that field. 
And I only found out about that about two years ago when we were at a little celebration for the book. And one of the leading people in the field said, you know, an entire generation read this book and wow. were, they were influenced by it. And, and now they're senior figures in the field. Well, I started to laugh there on the platform. And my first thought was, oh, gee, that's really cool. And the other thought was, am I that old? <laughs> I mean, they're senior <laughs> Anyway, I did a few more books, uh, once with a co-author, twice with a co-author, again, the same Ed Feigenbaum, and on and on. And uh, my most recent book is kind of a personal examination of all those things that happened, particularly how people would just say, no, what are you talking about? Machines thinking can't, can't happen. And I would be pulling on the sleeves. By that time, I lived in New York City. I'd be pulling on the sleeves of public intellectuals and saying, you know, this thing, this artificial intelligence, uh, this could be important. <laughs> they would just laugh. And that's where the, the book got its title. So, so can you tell me and, you know, people listen to this, why is it important? You know, if, if you were going to say, <laughs> and, and I, your reaction was really funny, was but, but why is it important? I think, I think, I mean, I know, but magnitude of its importance wasn't quite clear until the pandemic and, and until all of us stayed home. And this is the only way we can communicate. Let's put it this way. AI mm -hmm. is in every nook and cranny of the planet's life. What could be more important? Ray Kurzweil puts it quite nicely, and I think I think it's one of the. I have a weird um, relationship with Ray, Ray Kurzweil. When I say relationship, he doesn't even know me. But you know, it's like I really like him, almost envy him. But there are times that I am really angry with him. <laughs> you know, I'm like you know, like I'm like I cannot wait to speak to him. I actually have written an article which ends with an open letter to Ray Kurzweil, <laughs> you know, there are, there are times that I like, oh, and I just feel like the reason why is that sometimes almost comes across as so, it almost comes, comes across as spiritual, the way that he thinks about machines. And he's even written a book about right. spiritual machines, right? But then there are times that I feel like there's zero compassion for you know the faith of the, the billions of people that are essentially going to become dinosaurs <laughs> you know and I, and as a transition architect and a tech philosopher myself i feel like my goal and my um kind of role here is to try and make this transition less painful because i think it's going to be quite painful it already is because these are like seven billion people who almost overnight are going to find that they become potentially could become irrelevant. And, and I think the, the least we could do is to prepare them, to educate them, to teach them, uh, to think differently, to step up, to, um, you know, become an active participant rather than be a passive observer, which is what governments are doing okay. by giving people, you know, some money to say, just sit home. The universal basic income, let's say, if, if that's what it turns out to be, is the least we can do. That's the beginning. We do need to change education in such a way that people will find fulfillment other ways than their work, or at least the work they've been doing. There will be other jobs, but maybe not suitable for people who have been thrown out of work by yeah. intelligent machines. Uh, to get back to Ray, he was very cavalier about uh, predictions of when machines would be more intelligent than humans. And I'm, I'm afraid I don't share those predictions. Uh, so you in, don't think singularity is coming? <laughs> no. <Okay>. No. <laughs> uh, in many ways, machines already are smarter, quote unquote, than we are. But they're very limited domains. And to have artificial general intelligence, which the phrase is now, that's a long way away. And as one wise person pointed out, no humans have artificial 
No humans have general intelligence. We're pretty good at what we do, but we're not very good at what the next person does like that. Machines don't need to have uh, general intelligence to be disruptive. Like they've already disrupted. No, I was just referring to Ray's prediction. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Ray, Ray likes his prediction. Just go home and take a, a pill. You <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do really like Ray, I have to say. Like, I find it fascinating. I think I've read everything he's written. And I'm like, I'm always, I've got this, like I said, like almost like a love-hate relationship. I'm actually following supplementation regime. And, you know, he's big on longevity and all that. And, and we have an internal joke because when I read his book, I was, and I showed um, the supplementation to my doctor, my, my private doctor, I was like, look, I'm taking most of the things that he's talking about. And so we have like this uh, internal joke that I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, taking all this because I'm competing with Ray. I want to make sure I get to the singularity. <laughs> Yeah, and, and he's written a book called How to Be a Daniel. I'm essentially a Daniel, you know, like the kind of person. And what he means by that is somebody who is like a active participant and not a, um, a passive observer. And, I, and that's something that I completely uh, am on board with. And I, but, but my problem is I feel that this is not being explained to the general public properly not by governments, not by social media, not by big corporations. You know, they are quite happy to keep you busy with, um, you know, with uh, um, Netflix series and, and a lot of content on social media, which is one of the things that I wanted to actually talk to you about. Because when you started, there was no social media, you know, and, and, and now artificial intelligence is driving social media. Did you ever see that coming? In a sense, I did. I didn't see the effects. Who could? I remember being at a, a very early meeting, very early, 25 years ago, uh, where one, a spokesman from, for Google, a researcher from Google stood up and he said, hey, we're an AI company. We're looking for people at AI. And the buzz went around the room. Yeah, so are all these companies. They're, so is Apple. Uh, Facebook didn't exist then. But yeah, goes without saying, this is, this is AI driven. Yeah, 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 of course. So, so my worry is that I feel like there's too much emphasis on stealing people's attention um, and, and not truly educating. Yes, on the one hand, you can go on uh, YouTube and there are uh, all sorts of tutorials where you can teach yourself, you know, um, TensorFlow and, and machine learning this and that, right? And they are all there, but, but the way that the algorithms are set is like if you have the slightest propensity towards you know allowing your mind to be stolen in that direction or, or driven in that direction whether it's like cat videos or, or makeup videos or you know like whatever it is you know anything that's gonna draw your attention away from education and learning in general the algorithms are of all of these social media channels are set up in a way that they are not really encouraging education, the kind of education that we need. Probably not. And what will happen eventually is that people will get tired of being amused and want something else. You think? And yeah, I do. I do. Mm. It's like eating empty calories. But you know that you know that experiment where with the uh, with the mice where they allow the mice to uh, like find this button that will give them pleasure, right? And uh, and the mice they, they didn't want to eat, they didn't want to sleep, they didn't want to drink. They were they were basically once they found that pleasure button, they were basically driving themselves to death, just pleasuring themselves. And this is what I I don't know I I don't know I have a feeling that people are not going to get tired. <laughs> I mean, I really, really hope, I think, I think that there needs to be an active, almost intentional uh, drive, right, and, and education. It needs to be built into our educational modules and, and into the educational system. And that can happen. Yeah. Uh, it just needs to be somebody's priority. It's not anybody's priority just yet. Just yet, but but I, I yeah, and I, I really hope that we don't leave it too too late. Essentially, for some people, uh, there's physical pleasure, but th for other people, they want a variety of pleasures, and one kind of pleasure is intellectual pleasure, and 
they want to go down that rabbit hole and find out everything they can about. And if there's a question at the end, they will take it upon themselves to answer that question. So sort of tangentially, my quarrel with science museums, uh, science museums always present the world as if, okay, the hard problems have been solved, here they are. No, science museums should be full of questions. We don't know about this and we don't know about that. And you, young child, might be the person who finds the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yes, exactly. Uh, Pamela, when you were um, writing that book, the first book that you wrote on artificial intelligence, you talk a lot about the founding fathers. Where were the founding mothers? Why, where were the women in this picture? There were very few. I can think of maybe one or two, but very mm -hmm. few. And a big part of the reason for that is because they were scientists and science was a man's game in mm -hmm the 50s, the 60s, there were, there were women who stood out, like Grace Murray Hopper and a few others. Uh, Grace Murray Hopper eventually was recognized for the incredible work she did. And uh, in my husband's field, which was uh, tangential to, very tangential uh, compu to computing, he was in complexity, there were two or three women who were busy doing that. Then, and you know, I hadn't thought of this until it's coming out of my mouth. Women got interested in computing and language. Suddenly you began to see women doing things in computers and language. And how do you make a, a machine understand natural language and so on and so forth? That wasn't considered, I kid you not, that was not considered mainstream AI. That mm -hmm. was, you know, something the girls did or something, you know, who knows? Uh, and it was, it was crazy. But I think women just about own that field right now. There was that. There was the fact that bright young women got out of college, beautifully credentialed, beautifully credentialed, and then went into the real world where they were bonked on the head every time they raised their head. There was so much misogyny in the field a friend and I did a study of women in Silicon Valley for the National Science Foundation. And what we discovered was you had to have elbows of steel to put up with the kind of nonsense that men put on women. You know, and, and earlier you asked me, how can we get young women interested in this? They're interested in it. They're fascinated by it. They just get tired of being blocked this way and blocked that way. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Well, people are doing things about it now, but it, for 50 years, that's how it's been. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I remember uh, when we were having the um, email communication, I mentioned to you that I'm really passionate about instigating a sense of curiosity and deep interest in science and technology in girls. And you said that they are interested. They don't need to be, uh, it doesn't need to be instigated. It's just that if anything, they just need to not be stopped. Yeah. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, which is a, a leading university for education in AI, has a 50-50 student body uh, in their AI programs, half men, half women, um, they know how to do it. And mm -hmm. how they do it is, uh, you know, up on the web. But uh, uh, there is one issue with like, obviously a, a big enough pool of women going into science and technology um, and engineering, all that stuff. And the other thing is that when we look at the top tier, right? So, so like the, the world is run by 10 corporations. Uh, right? Five in the US and five in China. They're all founded by and run by men. There's not a single woman in that picture. And that's what truly worries me because that's where the, the future of humanity is being decided. Um, so yes, it's, it's a good thing and good start to get women going into the field. But I see a lot more women in as junior, you know, on a junior level. Uh, I remember talking to some girls that I was thinking about hiring um, for, for the platform that I'm building like in their early 20s. And they said, um, I told them, look, I want you guys to try and work together to build this. You know, I think between yourselves, you, know, you have what it takes and you can learn and you can learn on the job. And they said that they don't feel confident 
to to take that on um you know they they wanted like a senior person you know to to drive them and to me that is part of the problem because you know if somebody told me take this um opportunity i would never ever say i can't i would take it first and then i figure it out right you know and we need i feel like we need more women developing that kind of sense of that, that, that's socialization it's mm -hmm. nothing to do with the inherent intelligence of women or the inherent drive, it's socialization. You have to get over that. I mean, what was this English major doing writing about artificial intelligence? Exactly. <laughs> I did it because nobody told me I couldn't. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we need more, we need to develop that sense of, you know, confidence and, and risk taking and say, you know, what is the worst thing that can happen? You know, like. You can fake it. It's yeah, okay. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so, so one of the questions I had was like, I feel that the AI revolution is giving us the opportunity to correct many of our long held biases and erroneous beliefs um, and almost rewrite the course of history for the future generations. And that what we just talked about, about women is that's part of that, right? Whether it's for biological being or non-biological beings, you know, we can debate that whether the non-biological beings have got what part of our future is going to be uh, or how much we are going to merge with technology. But, but even if we just look at the way that we are right now, I feel like artificial intelligence is giving us an opportunity to rewrite it, to rewrite these biases, because now we are developing algorithms that we can, for the first time, we can say, this is a bias. Our brains are algorithms, and, and these biases have stayed in our brain for, well, I say they're algorithms. We don't know exactly, you know, but... but I, 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 I take your point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like our brains behave in some ways, uh, sometimes in some aspects, you know, you could say that they behave in an algorithmic way and they are filled with biases that have lasted to this day and uh, you could say that biology is a kind of algorithm because it's like running on this for example in in the past we had we need we had a need for men for the physical strength of men right and that's why men dominated but that's now changed because we don't need that physical strength um, quite the same way because we now have machines doing that part. So that's changing the balance of, uh, you know, the gender balance in a way. So we have an opportunity to rewrite it. That's why, to me, I feel like it's more important than ever to get women to be part of this process of rewriting it. So um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how do we make that happen and how quickly does this need to happen? Well. Yeah. Interesting you should ask because yes, of course, bias crops up in the part of artificial intelligence called machine learning. The machine is looking at millions, tens of millions of decisions in real time and looking at the patterns and looking to see what it can make of those patterns. Okay, well, it turns out that in those tens of millions of individual decisions, a lot of the people who are making those decisions are biased because they're human beings. Some companies, for example, Google, has stepped back and said, we got to point these biases out. And furthermore, we've got to head them off at the pass and not just act the biased information that we are picking up. Very nice. So Google instituted a committee to do that, more than a committee, it's a, a, a part of the uh, organizational structure, hired several people, among them a well-regarded young woman who looked at some of the things that were coming out of Google and said, hey, no, this is, this is very biased. Even what you're doing is biased. And she submitted a paper. When her boss found out about it, he said, no, you, you may not submit that paper to a meeting, a public meeting. Uh, long story short, she ended up getting summarily fired. And Google has had no explanation for this. I saw it as this incredible resistance on the part of men in power to be called out. The bias that, yes, is being exhibited, but they don't want to, they don't want to hear it. Better to fire the messenger. I mean, she'll be fine. She's really well regarded, and you know, so, somebody will gladly offer a, a better job. But to, to do that, 
so ham-handedly. I mean, it's all laid out in front of you there. This is how it is for women. This is how it is for Black people. On and on and on. And nobody apologizes. They just say, that's our right. We get to say, you're fired. So okay. it'll be a while. So. I appreciate that it will be a while, but my worry is that we don't have time. The reason is that this is taking over so quickly, right? It's like, it's all happening so quickly. When you look at a pandemic, it, you know, it has compressed a journey of 15 years into three years, you know? <laughs> so it's just like, we need women in technology now, not like we need them yesterday, you know? We don't have that time. That's why I'm, you know, I'm like sort of banging my head against the wall and trying to think like, you know, how, how can we, galvanize more women to step forward and i think to me the biggest the best solution is for women to start businesses you know because it, it's very hard like you know to go into google and facebook and all that stuff and try to make your way to the top like you'll be like waiting forever that's why i started my own every woman who who feels compelled to do something Take the matters in your own hand. Go out there. Find out those solutions. You know, bulldoze your way. Like, that's what we need. We need, like, an army of women bulldozing their way, you know, to get investment, to build businesses, to, to change the scene. I have an old friend who right, left Stanford Research Institute, where he was a researcher, and he said, I'm not going back to the university, and I'm not going to the government, because I really feel the best way to make fast, good change is through business. And yes. so we do. Exactly. I, I completely agree. Now, Paola, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was China. You know, because when you were writing the book and when you were unfolding of artificial intelligence, China was nowhere to be seen. Did you ever see this coming? And, and from where you're standing, how do you see China changing um, the trend and, uh, and this equation here? I certainly didn't see it coming early. But in 2001, my husband were, and I were traveling in, in China, and we were at one of the major technical universities outside Shanghai, and they were showing me around, and I looked at this architectural model, and I said, oh, is this your new campus? And they said, no, that's just our software campus. It was, in, it was enormous. No, these are very smart people. In fact, I just found out this morning that my most recent book will be published by a Shanghai publisher. Um, they, they asked me for permission to send me. So yeah, they're on top of it. They're totally on top of it. And you must imagine that some of, you know, you've got a billion people in, in China. A friend of mine did a little calculation. He said, I figure the number of geniuses there is about equal to the population of France. <laughs> of course they're going to do great. Um, they, and they're driven. And their government wants it to happen. So it'll happen. They came from nowhere to right up there. There's a lot of nonsense, and I will call it nonsense, that, oh, we're just copycats. We're doing, you know, we're doing it. Uh, the same thing you guys are doing in the West, we're just, you know, doing it faster. No, 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 no. Let's say it's only half the population of France that is a genius, a genius level in China. They, they'll zoom away. The question is, can we, can we all mm -hmm. cooperate in such a way that we can make it good for all of humanity, not just a nationalistic project? Yeah. So, you know, I, I see a lot of people talking about how are we going to make it so that it shares our values and it will retain our values, right? But when we say our values, whose value are we talking about? Are we talking about the Iranian Muslims, Chinese, um, you know, or, or the Indian Buddhists or like Christians in, you know, in the West? So we, as humanity, we have so many different values. So we are not yet able to have a dialogue between each other. But now we are entering a three-way dialogue with, you know, because I'm, I always say conversation is no longer between two people. It's always between three, uh, you know, because there's always my series that is here listening, right? And it's 
learning is constantly learning when I'm typing, when I'm using social media, when I'm using, you know, the internet, doing anything, I'm constantly uh, teaching and learn and the, the system is uh, impacting my decisions. So how do we go about, first of all, bringing together, aligning our uh, interests and then making sure that our interest is aligned with artificial intelligence? Well, tell me if I could answer that question definitively, I would be sainted. <laughs> it's got to be very slowly and very methodically done. Uh, in the United States, we have at least three major organizations that are looking at exactly these questions. Have they arrived at conclusions yet? No, they're still discovering what there is to discover. Every university uh, and probably secondary school has a course in how do we imbue artificial intelligence with good values, which steps back, what do we mean by good values? So this is one of the most interesting, I say interesting, it's going to be horrendous at times, interesting sets of questions that we as homo sapiens have addressed because we're going to have to find a lot of common interests that we think we don't have, but we probably do, mm -hmm. but it's got to be uncovered and diligent work. So when you talk about homo sapiens, you know, it reminds me of, I wrote an article about uh, the future of um, work and, you know, art and how COVID-19 is accelerating the technology trend. And in it, I mentioned, there's this scene, do you know uh, Professor Max Tegmark of MIT? I really like him, like I, I love all, uh, all of his books. He mentions, describes a scenario where he's sitting uh, at a dinner with Elon Musk and his um, then wife and then his wife and, and also Larry Page and his wife. And they are having a conversation and Larry Page uh, tells Elon Musk that you're being a species. Uh, you know, because uh, because he's like, uh, there's no, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but there's no, nothing inherently special about our carbon-based life and that the silicon-based life, uh, if you could call it life, is, is just as valuable and that if we ever manage to go to other planets, we are going to go in digital form. So, so you are talking about us being uh, homo sapiens and we have all of these things in common as homo sapiens, but it seems to me that uh, someone like Larry Page is already thinking about a scenario where either we have integrated or, or we've, you know, upgraded, I don't know, however you think about it, to this digital form, you know, essentially. I think of my work as a transition architect because that is a transition that even if it's, I think it's inevitable, but even if it's not inevitable, there are people like Ray Kurzweil, like Larry Page, you know, there are people really want it to be and they will try and and they and in china also you know all the corporations in china yeah so 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 they they want to explore this form of digital life right and, and it's conceivable that that would be the future of humanity but um i'm most concerned about that transition period and and what's going to happen to our homo sapienness, you know, because, because I, I wish that we could go back in history and like talk to apes as they became humans, you know, and <laughs> what it was like. And I, and I just wonder whether throughout these years of hanging out with the founding fathers of uh, artificial intelligence and being around people in the artificial intelligence scene, are these the kind of conversations that uh, they worry about, talk about, or are they just like single-mindedly? There was lots of talk about that. I socialize with them as well as being their, uh, their Boswell. And one night, one of them said to me, how would you feel if a machine wrote a novel? I was writing novels in those days. And I said, oh, it, it, it might be pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And he, he was shocked because everybody he'd put this question to before had said, no, that's awful. That's a terrible thing. I personally think it would be great to have different kinds of minds around that uh, could help me clear the clutter out of my mind. That's just mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. But the values, well, we'll see. You know, I remember when you, I, I listened to your podcast with Lex Friedman. I, I really like his podcast. I listened to all of it. 
I remember just something you mentioned in that podcast that really stuck with me. And he was talking about how some people like Elon Musk or it was uh, Stephen Hawking who have, you know, warned against uh, the uh, dangers of AI, right? And, and I remember you mentioned something that was really nice. You were like, it's because they are just men who are worried about intelligence, you know, existing in, in something outside of the male crew. <laughs> So, so tell me about that. Oh, uh, in my book, I call it the male gaze, uh, which I took from movie critic, a, a woman who said, have you noticed that most movies are made from the point of view of males? The woman is always object. She's always this. She's always that. And I thought, yes, I've noticed that. Thank you for pointing it out. Thank you for giving me a phrase. And as I... Uh, at the time that Hawking and Musk and others were saying, oh, you've got to get rid of AI because, you know, da 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 da, uh, I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, you've always been the smartest guy on the block. And now here comes somebody who might be, or something that might be smarter. And you're just going to snuff it out because you don't want your place in the smartness hierarchy threatened. Uh, and so on. And I think. To me, that was what the, uh, the whole issue of these guys jumping up and down and saying snuff it out was about. They were the smartest guys on the block and here came something that might be smarter, too bad. Um, and that didn't win me a whole bunch of friends as you can imagine. So do you feel like, like do you feel that women will not feel as threatened? They can, they can communicate or, or integrate better? I think women's egos are someplace else. Let me put it that way that if it had to do with something where women have their own ego invested in it and an artificial something came along, they'd be just as upset and frightened. Most women don't think of intelligence as their major asset or aspect or whatever you want to call it. That somehow reminds me, there's a wonderful roboticist at Carnegie Mellon as it happens named Manuela Veloso. Manuela took it up upon herself to figure out how would you imbue robots with empathy, with cooperation, with teamwork, and so on. So she developed, and it's well along, uh, two teams of robots that play soccer. We call it soccer in the United States, football, the rest of the world. Guys looked at that and they said, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, let's, let's, have, let's work it up so we can have humans versus the robots in 50 years and see who wins. And Manuela just smiled because what she was really interested in was imbuing robots with teamwork, with cooperation, with uh, that kind of emotional intelligence. So you see what you want to see. <laughs> And yeah. she's been well-funded. The project is going along just beautifully. But I had to laugh. I had to laugh. Yeah, that's definitely. I, um, I interviewed um, one of our um, conference panelists who is a professor of economics at uh, San Francisco University. And she said that men and women are both competitive competitive but in very different ways um, and that um, competition for women is more about protecting you know like whether it's protecting their children or protecting their you know their family but most importantly they find that they win by collaboration by by cooperation when you're raising a family you can't you can't do it without cooperation you need grandma to come in and you need you know your husband to da 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 yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if we could replace the leader of North Korea with a female and the leader of China with a, a female and the leader of America with a female, you know, I, I, we already have, <laughs> you know, Germany. Like, I really think the, all of these women, like, and put them in a room and they will just get on and they will, like, then there will be no ego, like, they will just... <laughs> Well, I'm not sure. Okay, maybe, maybe maybe there's a bit of ego, but but there are I, I don't know. I, I think collaboration would be a lot easier. It might be. It might be. Um, you look at someone like Margaret Thatcher. She was not big on collaboration. Oh yeah, well, I suppose yes. But 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 because that's 
partly because maybe she was, if you take a woman and put them, say, in Google or Facebook or Amazon, right? Like they're operating within a system that is already male dominated, right? Whereas if, if, the, if we change the balance of society uh, in a way that there is more female perspective, you know, you were talking about films, right? Like majority of films are, are um, from a male perspective. And that's, think about how the film industry is changing the perception of society. I wanted to talk to you about gender a little bit, you know, because like we've always talked about, we've always thought, uh, thought of everything in a binary way, right? For, for millennia, right? It's like good and bad, heaven and hell, man and woman, right? Um, and it feels like for the first time as we, are merging with technology, if, if you put it that way, uh, robots don't exactly have a gender. And, and, and I just wonder, you know, in the past few years, there's been a lot more openness towards talking about non-binary and, you know, transgender. And I wonder if you think, you know, as somebody who has studied artificial intelligence for the past 60 years or so, or, or observed and written about, do you feel that there's any kind of parallel between the way that we are starting to think about gender and the development of AI and how we interact? Like your theory could be a man or could be a woman, or, you know, because my theory is a man. Uh, some, uh, some people like uh, they have a, a female theory. But whenever I'm talking about theory, I, uh, I use the term he because it's, it's a male um, sound. And I was thinking a few days ago, what would it be like if I could mix the two? And it, it had a sound, synthesized sound that was not, not a male or female. You know, and I think we are going to increasingly see, like, you know, in a virtual environment, you could actually, Ray Kurzweil does, a, I don't know if you've seen, the, he does this experiment where, I think it's a TED talk, actually. I saw it probably a long time ago, where, uh, or, or maybe I read about it in his book, where he's like, you know, singing from the viewpoint of a female with a female voice, you know, with, I think, with his daughter, um, you know, and he's like, it really gave him the, for the first time, a sense of what it was like to be a woman, you know? <laughs> so, so I just wonder how AI is, technology in general, but AI in particular, is changing the gender question. They're certainly moving along in parallel. Whether they have anything to do with each other, I can't really tell. Most of the people I know who are active in uh, that kind of thing don't know much about AI. Uh, I'm not sure that most AI programs know much about male versus female. This is really a human kind of thing. I would love to think AI would eliminate, extinguish, misogyny, racism, all the terrible things, all the terrible ways we have of sorting people into categories. And if it does it, great. I'm glad to see it. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Well, it's been, a, it's been great talking to you, Pamela. If there's anything else that comes to your mind uh, to share with our audience, uh, anything you want to say about your books, the work, that you're doing, where they can follow, that would be amazing to share. And uh, was otherwise, thank you. This has been a very stimulating conversation. Absolutely, and I will I will make sure to include all the links to your work, to your books, uh, so that people can get. Yeah, unfortunately, them. my website is under construction again, so. I'm sure maybe by the time this goes out, because it will be a few weeks. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Pamela McCordock. Be sure to check out her books and follow her journey as she continues to be active in this space. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star review. You can also find the full video of these conversations on my YouTube channel. Oh, and connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or Clubhouse at Somi Ariane. Finally, if you are not yet a member of Fempeak, head over to fempeak.ai, register and join a community that actively supports women. <laughs>